Body Wrappers, Angela Luzio is happy to sponsor this episode of Conversations on Dance. Body Wrappers, Angela Luzio is known for its durable and soft total stretch tights and Angela Luzio shoes. New to the Angela Luzio shoe collection is the Instant Fit 4-Way Total Stretch Canvas Ballet Slipper and the Instant Fit 4-Way Total Stretch Canvas Y Strap Half Sole. Make sure to try them on at your local dance retail store and see why they are called Instant Fit. And while you're there, take a look at Tyler Peck's beautiful and unique leotards that move perfectly with the body and won't ride up in the back. You may view the products at bodywrappers.com or at your favorite dance retail shop or online store. To review and buy the entire collection of Tyler Peck designs, go to dancewearcorner.com. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Breeden. And you're listening to Conversations on Dance. This week on the podcast, we are joined in San Francisco by one of the world's most in-demand choreographers, Christopher Wielden. Having trained at Royal Ballet, Wielden was taken into the company, but soon transferred to the New York City Ballet, where he rose to the rank of soloist. His choreographic talents were soon recognized, and while still in his 20s, he was named resident choreographer of the New York City Ballet. He was shortly after in demand at major companies all over the globe, including the Bolshoi Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, and the Royal Ballet. In 2014, he made his Broadway directorial debut with An American in Paris, a production that garnered him a Tony for his work as a choreographer. We talk with him about what it was like finding his voice as a young choreographer, how he made the transition to Broadway, and what continues to inspire his work. This episode is brought to you by San Francisco Ballet. Well, thank you, Chris, for joining us today. We're so happy to have you. We've been trying to do this for a really long time, so it's really fun to do it, even in person. We thought maybe we were going to... Finally. I know. We're very excited. So let's start from the beginning. Can you tell us a little bit about your training at the Royal Ballet School and your time dancing with the company? Oh, wow. We're going way back. Way back. back. All the way way back. It was a dark and stormy night. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I joined the Royal Ballet School when I was actually eight years old. I went right through the school from junior associates, which is kind of twice weekly ballet classes for babies, Mm -hmm. um, through to uh, um, through White Lodge, which is the junior school and then into the Royal Ballet Upper School and then finally into the company if you're, you know, if you're lucky. Um, So that was, uh, yeah, that was sort of my, that was my, my course through the school and um and I did make it into the Royal Ballet for about 10 minutes <laughs> before I decided to like up and off to the US mm-hmm. um, where I joined New York City Ballet. How did you decide to leave and go to New York? Do you know, it's funny to say this, but even at 17, well, actually, I was, it was more like 18 when I, when I finally kind of made the choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd been with the, with the, with that organization, with the Royal Ballet School since okay. I was, since I was eight years old. Right. And you know, at that point in your life, you're not really, well, I suppose that 10 years does feel, still feel like a long time. Yeah. And, um, I just got the opportunity and felt like it was, um, something I'd always wanted to do and why not give it a go. And I knew that I was leaving the Royal Ballet behind, but also I felt like they would be there if I wanted to go back. And then, you know, Anthony Dow was the director then. And he said, if you want to come back after a year, then I'll look at you again. I can't promise that I'll take you back. Um, back in the company, um, but uh, you know, I'll certainly take a look. So, right. that's great. Yeah. Um, how did that opportunity come about? It's pretty unusual for New York City Ballet to take um, foreigners like that. So, yes. How did that um, work out for you? Well, it was right. <laughs> it was right when they were doing that huge Balanchine Festival. Um, and they actually wanted me to join uh, a little bit earlier. I missed the festival. I joined right after it, but they were looking for, for men. And I showed up in New York, actually, it's a very long story, but I'll make it really short because it's kind of fun. Um, I sprained my ankle. Um, the Royal Ballet was sending me to the Eric Brun competition in Canada. Um, and I sprained my ankle a few weeks before, uh, during rehearsals for that and ended up, uh, just at home, as you do when you're injured, with you know ice wrapped around the foot, watching TV, yeah. and um, this commercial came on for Hoover vacuum cleaners. And the deal was, if you bought like the I can't remember the t- type of Hoover it was, but the you know their new brand, yeah. um, then you would get a free round trip ticket to New York. 
or to the I think it was maybe to the US like you could choose San Francisco or New York or That's crazy. I know All you have I mean it was a Hoover buy. right now. Yeah. <laughs> it was a no brainer cuz the Hoover was like I don't know 60 pounds or something and a round trip ticket was not that. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um I hobbled out and I bought the Hoover and I never actually used the Hoover ever. <laughs> uh, but I did get the I did get the round trip ticket and <sighs> Um, flew to New York and was rehabbing and I wrote to New York City Ballet and said, you know, I'm with the Royal Ballet. I don't know the company at all. I'd just love to have the opportunity to come in and take class. It was our mid-season break, so I needed to, you know, I was going back on stage right when I got back. Mm-hmm. And um, Peter was auditioning uh, other dancers. And um, in fact, at the end of the class, he thought I was the one auditioning. So this was all like crazy fate, right. Uh-huh. right? First day in New York, went to take class with New York City Ballet, hadn't done anything touristy, walked into Lincoln Center, walked out of Lincoln Center with a job. Crazy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I, and I didn't accept it then and there because I was like, oh, wait, I think I'd like to go and see the Empire State Building. And, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I should watch some performances of the company, yeah. which I did. I watched every show that week. And like m- my mind was blown from, you know, it was like Opus Night in the Dreamer with uh, with Peter Ball and Wendy, who was like just a principal and Square Dance with Katie Tracy and Peter Ball again. Um, and Prodigal Son uh, with Robbie LaFosse and Maria Caligari and all these ballets I'd never seen. I had mm-hmm. never seen the Four Temperaments, so Four Temperaments for the first time. Um, uh, yeah, so by the end of the week, I was like, sign me up, I'm coming. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so during this time, were you just completely focused on dancing or were you kind of thinking about choreography and exploring that? I had already started choreographing a little bit mm-hmm. back home, but only little little pieces. I'd done a piece for a, a school in London. I'd done a piece for um, the Royal Ballet Choreographic Group. Um, but yeah, that, that was, that was it. Although I do remember kind of marching into Peter's office and like putting a bunch of VHSs. It's the day of yeah. VHS. <laughs> <laughs> he was you like, know, oh my gosh, like, what are these? Staggering in with like a pile <laughs> of them and saying, you know, I, I, I'd really like to choreograph. This is important to me and please take a look. Um, and so what happened after that? So he did. And then he asked me to do a couple of things at the school they used to do. I don't know if they still do the, they used to do like a fall choreographer's workshop thing in, in the school and um uh and then he asked me to do workshop workshop mm-hmm. so it was studio workshop then workshop workshop and then my first ballet for the company which f- followed probably i don't know a couple of years after that mm-hmm. um what uh how did you have the guts to go in and say peter this is what i'm doing we, is it just being young and i want to do that so i'm going to say it like yeah, what's the I think so i mean and also <laughs> You know, I knew who Peter was, mm-hmm. but I hadn't grown up. He hadn't been sort of the sort of right. uh, this tower, literally yes, towering lit- figure, literally yeah. towering icon of dance. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'd seen him in magazines, and but you know, you associate like still when I go back to the Royal Ballet Company, I walk in through the stage door and I feel a little bit like a twelve-year-old boy because uh-huh. right. you never quite detach. Yes, you know? mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I think it was, and I and I was in a new place. Like it was a new, fresh start for me. I didn't feel like I really had anything to lose, mm-hmm. um, except perhaps my job. <laughs> that would have sucked. Yeah, just having given up my position at the Royal Ballet and then uh, <laughs> get out. Uh, um, so yeah, I, I I wasn't nervous about that at all. And um, Peter's was always a very good listener. Like, and I feel like he he wanted to. Well, the New York City Ballet under his. Um, directorship has had you know a lot of success with promoting new work and festivals and so um and the diamond project was still going on back then and that was always kind of like this i mean we didn't do 12 ballets at once um but uh but it was always a sort of uh, um quite a high quotient of of new work right so uh, your early experiences choreographing for the company, you were obviously dancing a lot. You were dancing as a, a member of the Court of Ballet, which is uh, an extremely demanding task, especially when you're young. I, they just throw you into everything, right? right so right. how is that um, balance for you? And do, do you feel like being a dancer helped you choreographically or mostly it was uh, you know, a rough balance? Yeah, no, it was okay. I mean, 
I was really focused on being a dancer mm -hmm. back then as well. So I knew I wanted to choreograph, but I wasn't at the point where I decided that I was just going to focus on choreography. So um, I choreographed when I could in, you know, in breaks, in the mid-season, I'd go off somewhere. In the summer break, I'd go off and choreograph somewhere. But I, but my main focus was dancing. So I, and I remember the first, the first time I had a ballet at New York City Ballet, Slavonic Dancers, the premiere that night, I was in the ballet prior to it and the ballet after it. So I took a bow in a suit in uh, makeup, which was really, <laughs> really strange. Uh, I have wow. these pictures now. I'm like, oh, yeah, that was an odd choice. Mm -hmm. What were you feeling like in the first ballet that evening? Were you like so nervous? I for think your I ballet was time? really distracted. Yeah, right. I, don't, bet. I probably made a few mistakes, yeah. <laughs> actually. That's hysterical. So what were some of the challenges for you when you would start choreographing a new piece and you would be in front of the room basically directing your peers That's what is that age, like for right? you yeah yeah uh, um it was tricky and i wasn't very good at it at the beginning like i think i just associated the i mean it's it's sort of yeah the, i'd only ever worked with choreographers that were really tough mm -hmm. <laughs> in the studio right um, and, and I, I think I thought at the beginning that, 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 that was the way that I was supposed to be. Right. And then actually a dear friend of mine who remains a really dear friend. And I think we became very close over this, pulled me aside one day and I didn't know her that well at the time she was in the court of ballet. And she's like, you have to stop talking to us like this, <laughs> right? You have to like, understand that we are like busting our asses for you and and it was a really great kind of wake-up call and thankfully it happened fairly early on right so um so that was there was a definite like shift in the way that I started to you know you know adjust the way that I that I worked right. and um uh so that was a good lesson um, and then it became very easy and then it became very collaborative and then I started working with Jack and Wendy and that, that was always a great sort of um, a very, uh, just a, there was just dialogue in the room and the ideas were jumping sort of back and forth between us and, um, it wasn't, pres nothing was prescribed. We were exploring and discovering together. And so that was, that was kind of a, gr a lovely way to have learned that lesson. In right. Mm -hmm. I love that she did that. That's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> she must've been a little scared to do it though. Like yeah, it was, it was right. It was right by the fountain at Lincoln Center. Very turning point. I'm like this is a scene turning from point. Turning Point. Oh. I love that. Here's where I, you know, turn turn around and storm off. <gasps> oh my goodness! Hall. <laughs> That's good. So, how did things begin to build to the point where you ultimately had the position of uh, resident choreographer created for you? Um, what was that path like? Um, actually, that was, it was all quite surprising. Um, I decided at 28 to stop dancing so I could focus more on choreography. I, I just like, my body was starting to feel a bit broken and I felt like I danced everything I wanted to dance. I wasn't going to become a principal. I kind of knew that, you know, you, you just reach a point where you're like, okay, well it hasn't happened. So it's probably not going to happen. Right. Um, and all the people around me that, I, that were sort of going that route had gone that route. So mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well I'm happy with soloist and I've, you know, danced a ton and, worked with Jerry and, you know, I danced for Macmillan when I was back in London. And um, so I felt good about stopping. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I told Peter I was going to stop, he was like, okay, well, I want to, let's have, let's make some sort of agreement. I think it was artist in residence maybe mm -hmm. before it, be it became resident choreographer. And they're all, you know, in the end, they're just sort of, it's just a title, but mm -hmm. um but yeah, so that's sort of how that happened. He was he was like, I don't want you to leave us completely. And of course, you can still go off and make work elsewhere. He was always extremely generous mm -hmm. about that. He was like, just not ABT, please, because uh, it's across the yeah. street. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> Which was fair enough. Yeah, you know? yeah. So what were some of the um, details of that contract? Were there a certain number of ballets you were creating per year with the company? I can't remember. I don't know if I think it was. I think it was a one ballet per year. Mm -hmm. But again, it was that was quite sort of fluid, and sometimes mm -hmm. it was more than one. Right. You know, a couple of years I did. I did two. Um, Peter was. He wanted just wanted new work on the stage. So. Right. 
We will return to conversations on dance in a moment, but first we want to tell you about Dimensions Dance Theater of Miami. Following its debut in 2016, Dimensions Dance Theater of Miami has quickly made a name for itself as a promising new ballet company with a dazzling repertoire reflective of the vibrant Latin culture of its home city of Miami. June 26th and 27th, the company will be making its New York City debut at the Joyce Theater, followed by a performance at the Jacob's Pillow Inside Out series, a free outdoor performance on June 29th. At the Joyce, the company's diverse program includes Gerald Arpino's sensually charged light rain and a Sephiris, a striking sculptural work created by rising choreographic talent Ariel Rose of Miami City Ballet. A triple bill at the pillow includes an excerpt from Light Rain, a Sephiris, and another company premiere by Rose Vow, a site-specific work originally commissioned by Miami City Ballet that will be performed on stage for the first time. You can help support this young company's summer tour now by visiting youcaring.com and search Dimensions Dance Theater of Miami. There you will also find ticket and performance information. That's youcaring.com and search Dimensions Dance Theater of Miami. If you have an event or performance that you are looking to promote on Conversations on Dance, go ahead and email us for more information at info at conversationsondancepod.com. Do you ever, did you ever feel like um, you had a hard time kind of keeping those creative juices flowing? I feel like when you ma- are making so much work, it must mm-hmm. be really difficult to maintain that. Yeah, not so much at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you've made as many ballets as I have now, like I'm always looking for ways to like reinvent and sure. try something mm-hmm. new. And mm-hmm. hence, you know, go off to Broadway for a bit, coming back. Um, and now it's been nice coming back into the studio. Again, I just made a piece of the Royal Ballet this at the beginning of the year. And this piece, and they're very, very, very different, um, even in sort of the language that I'm playing with. Um, so that's that's been sort of fun. Uh, it's been exciting to be back in the room again. Yeah, yeah. I, that makes me think of that balancing quote: uh, "My muse must come to me on union time." Yeah, because yeah. I, I, I can't <laughs> yeah. imagine what that would be like. You know, dancers, we we know what ha- we have to do every day, but you have to you have to pull something out of yourself. Yeah, um, that. Yeah. Uh, you don't know whether it's going to be. I mean, there's there's a lot there's a lot of unknown when you're in the studio, and you know sometimes you feel um, confident in the connection that you have with the dancers that you're working with, but that doesn't necessarily end up meaning that the piece is going to work out. You're just having right. a good time, right? <laughs> yeah, and you know, I wish there was a bit more of a a sort of reassuring kind of sign that you were on the right track but you just aren't until you put it in front of an audience yeah you just have no idea i think that that's the same for the dancers if the rehearsal process is positive you think the ballet is going to be great no matter what and if it's uh you know a little more trying it's hard to tell yeah um and then sometimes you you really don't know until you're out in the front of the house you don't and it's just I'm always I'm always surprised, and sometimes the ballet I really ballets I really love are the ones that the critics really don't, and vice versa. Sometimes they're like, "This was wonderful," and you're like, mm, "Was it? Like <laughs> it was my best work." But, so, um, yeah. So who knows? Mm. Who knows? Well, let's talk about Broadway. You brought it up for a second there, but um, you won a Tony Award for an American in Paris, and you had a, a very successful run of Brigadoon in the fall. So what very kind of... Run of unfortunately, <laughs> too short. Short. <laughs> short. <laughs> I'm glad I got in before. I, I mean, it it was selling like hotcakes at the end there yeah, because yeah. it was only a week. Yeah, um, yeah, we got to sure. bring it back. It was yeah, beautiful. we'll try. We'll try. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, what drove you into this arena? What Were you always interested in musical theater? Yeah, I was actually. I started. Uh, my parents took me up to London to see quite a lot of theatre because they um, they love loved it and were both. They met doing like amateur dramatics, you know, in our little you know province of Somerset. Mm-hmm. Um, so they so they love theatre, uh, and I think I would have probably if I could have sung or if my, maybe if my training had gone in that direction, I would probably have preferred to to do musical theater than ballet yeah as a performer right. right and now i kind of you know i sort of sit there in auditions i'm like this is amazing <laughs> people are coming in like one after the other and singing for me <laughs> it's like it's so it's so it's interesting it's such a privilege and i think because i mean i'm sure all directors feel that way but sometimes you you look and you see people kind of all sitting behind tables going uh, you know dr- the drudgery of the audition process but right. it's kind of a 
it's an amazing thing, I you bet. know. Uh, Zoe, Zoe Zion, who's former podcast guest. <laughs> um, yes. She was assisting on Carousel, and she would talk about that experience, too, that she would just be up there, like, so enamored, and then watching... Uh, everyone else be like, okay, next, next. Yeah. She's just like, I could listen to this all day. Yeah. I know. I actually sometimes forget that I'm supposed to be judging right. Right. whether they're actually <laughs> good it. for a role. I'm just, I get lost. And well. I, actually when we did the uh, Brigadoon auditions, I was like, I'm not sitting behind this table anymore. It feels so like them and us. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> I think the casting director, director was a little taken aback because I'm like, I'm actually going to move my chair in front of the table. Uh, and I ended up like putting it off to the side a uh-huh. little bit yeah. because because I could tell when the actors came in as well, you know, there's sort of a protocol and, mm-hmm. and they yeah. were just like, they're used to it. Yeah. The what other are you way, doing yeah. in our space? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, but it, yeah, it just feels, if I, just, I wouldn't want to, I can't imagine. It must be. I can't imagine doing it as, you know, we never had to go through that as ballet dancers right. really. So way, yeah. like coming in and being really vulnerable mm-hmm. and just like, depending on, you know, not knowing what they're looking for and it's that's tough yeah it's really tough so how did the process of working on a broadway show and like you said there's casting directors there's all these other elements coming together instead of just you which it normally is so how was the process different um well that's one of the best and one of the most challenging parts of Mm -hmm. of of working on broadway is that there are so many people and you're collaborating and it's a team and Mm -hmm. um and you know you bounce ideas off of each other. it's just there's a there's a lovely community that forms around a musical mm. um but um that that also what comes with that is a, it's a lot of opinion and a lot of um there's quite a lot of because i think because the finances of a broadway musical are often high pressure um there then there's also a you know kind of a little bit of fear that surrounds the process and mm. Um, so sticking to your vision, uh, is, is, can be tricky. Right. Um, that makes sense. But it's exciting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, um, and we're getting to work with the, there's a different energy with, um, the way the, even the day works, mm-hmm. you know, in a ballet company, you come in, you're one of many projects that are going on at the same time and, mm-hmm. The dancers are amazing because they just go from one studio to the next and they just switch gears. And whereas it feels more like you form a, you form a very solid community very quickly because you're all focusing on the same, same thing. thing. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, could we talk a little bit about your piece that we'll be seeing tonight? The yeah. big premiere, yeah. uh, the opening of the Unbound Festival. Um, what was your inspiration for this, your 10th ballet for San Francisco Ballet? Actually, my 12th. It's your 12th. 12. This is my 12th. The but I don't think lies. it's my 10th. It's Maybe it's my 10th new ballet. If you don't oh, count, if you start, oh. don't count, you know. Okay. But I think it's still 11 because I did a part of it for a gala. Anyway, never mind. The numbers are numbered. <laughs> we're gonna, we're going to tell the internet to fix that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when Helgi invited me to come, he, you know, he sort of said, I want, I want this to be, um, uh, I want people to just kind of perhaps, um, you know, shed a skin in a way and, um, and do something that's pr- perhaps a little bit different, use this as a way to, um, push, p- yeah, push yourself in a, in a bit of a new direction. So I was like, okay, well, that sounds great. Um, of course, you have to do <laughs> – what he didn't say was you have three weeks to do it and you have the, the dancers <laughs> that I choose for you to do it with. <laughs> so, you know, there was some – there were – but actually, in a way, that that sort of was quite useful because you have to then plan your time out very carefully. And I got to work with some dancers that I wouldn't necessarily have chosen, all of them. Um, but it was quite – it was quite – it was quite a tough one because I, I set myself, t- I was like, I want to make a ballet that says something about the times we live in. Mm-hmm. And I want to make a ballet off point because I've never made a ballet off point. Really? The only, oh. the only piece off point I've made is, um, the part of from after the rain. Right. That's so crazy. Wow. So I'm like, I'm going to try and make a ballet off point. Oh. Sure. Um, so I sort of, I did, I did what was on, I did what was, uh, you know, what it said on the tin mm-hmm. essentially, or what Helgi put on his tin. Um, and, uh, and it's been, it's been great. It's been uncomfortable at times just because of that, because I'm like, oh, uncertain and, um, but, uh, yeah, I think I'm proud of what I've done. I I don't know. (laughs) Again, it's like, yeah, we'll, we'll see tonight. We'll see tonight. What is that like for you when you sit in the audience and watch a ballet and kind of 
you're within the people that are judging it. You're sitting with the audience. How does that feel for you? Um, it used to feel really, uh, I used to be terrified of it actually. I would used think. To, used to be a um, scary thing. But now I'm like, well, because you overhear things, right. you know, and g- good and bad. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm really used to it. It's sort of, it's, it's really, it's my, you know, it's my life. I'm, right. It's part of the process. It's part of the process. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and it's exciting to put a ballet, a new ballet in front of an audience for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're very excited to see it. We're really looking forward to it. I think we have enough time to yeah. close out with our lightning round where we just ask you a few questions. Everybody it, always says, oh, yeah, no, but it's, it's, it's fun. Don't worry. But it's fun. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the first question. You know, 10, 11, or 12, however many ballets you've made, <laughs> you can pick one to last forever. Which which one are, are you, you proudest of that you've made here? From here? Yes. San Francisco, Francisco Ballet. Uh, I really love Within the Golden Hour. I think that's maybe my favorite. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> see, that wasn't that hard. No. Yeah, <laughs> um, what is a dream production that you would like to mount on San Francisco Ballet? Dream production I'd like to mount on San Francisco. We're giving you uh, a limitless budget. We give you fifty million dollars. <laughs> I mean, it would be great to work on a big narrative work here, because mm-hmm. um, uh, these dancers are so capable of that, and um, and we've never we've never really done that. I've made sort of little s- ballets with a suggestion of story here. In mm-hmm. fact, my first ballet, Sea Pictures, um, which we renamed Sea Sick Pictures <laughs> after. Um, I sort of had a little bit of a story to it. Uh, but yeah, I've, that that would be fun. Yeah. Uh, what musical would you most like to direct next? Well, I'm actually directing a musical. Funny you should say that. Uh-huh. I'm directing a new musical, which um, I can't say what it is yet. Mm-hmm. But I, think oh, I was people, just going to say you heard it here first. Well, you kind of did. <laughs> um, uh, it's, I think people will be surprised uh-huh. that I'm doing it because it's sort of out of the box, which I'm super excited about. Right. Um, and I'm developing a new show based on the invention of Hugo Cabret, which is a children's book mm-hmm. um, uh, written by Brian Selznick, who I worked on my Nutcracker with. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and we've got a first reading of that on Monday. So I'm oh, that's super great. excited about so that. So great. So well, you are. One to the next. Yeah. 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 That's boom, awesome. Boom. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite place to visit when you're in San Francisco? Oh, I've got so many. Um, Give me a few. Yeah, I love, actually, I love the farmer's market down in the ferry building. Yes, I love it down the there. It's just like popping from like, from stall to stall, like a little bit of ice cream from here, a little oyster over here. Yeah. I was just going to say oyster. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's so great. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That's yeah. so great. We're really looking right. forward to seeing the premiere tonight. And cool. we thank you for taking time out of your day to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us this week. We will be back next Monday with an all new episode. In the meantime, subscribe on iTunes so you'll automatically be notified when we publish a new episode. Follow us on Instagram at Conversations on Dance and on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Convo on Dance. See you next week. Thank you for listening.